in actual fact, if you're representing true people, it's like, you no, know, where did that idea actually come from? Because you, then you're giving far too much credit to that, that manifestation of that that character when it's it's a real person. It encourages other people to also come to you with ideas. I th feel like if you always have an answer for everything, it's sort of like people don't want to mm -hmm. give ideas. They they could be like they could have a really good idea, but then like now nah, he, he always he knows what he's doing. I'm not yeah. gonna even. What they like do and how they design the the set was like something so like mind blowing. Like it was so dry in my head compared to like what the production designer did. Hi, I'm Jakub. And I'm Mark. And I'm Caleb. And we're in the same room. What? Look at us. So we're testing out a new format. We're on a couch and a chair. Well, they're on a couch, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're testing out a new format. We thought that it might be time for us to move into the same room. So we've moved around some furniture in our set and we're trying out this sort of in-person style yeah. podcast recording. We might start doing the podcast like this now, you know, in person. We'll see. Let us know what you think. Uh, we might change the title of the show as well to maybe something like On the Couch, which fits in with On the Timeline, On the Page, At, at the, the Table. table. <laughs> Just a bunch of prepositions. <laughs> Preposition the noun. <laughs> Preposition the noun. That seems to be our format. Yeah. So we're testing it out. Yeah. Also, obviously, today it's just us three. We haven't been in a podcast together for a long time yeah. since the writing podcast, which is a year ago. Yeah. We've been like obviously separately with the guests. And we also thought it was time that we show you, the viewer, after getting monetized. It's about time we give you a little treat. These are our legs. <laughs> um, we don't know if you've seen it before. The ones in the behind the scenes are not our real legs. Those ones were masked and masked in. This is. The ones that we actually use day-to-day -day life. So, you know, welcome to our legs as well. <laughs> Such a weird thing to say. So in today's podcast, we thought we'd talk a little bit about where does an idea come from and then turning that idea into words on a page and then turning those words into images. It's been a year since the last time we had a department spotlight on the on screenwriting. And we just thought what we could explain what we've learned over the past year, what you guys might take away from it. We are just putting it all into perspective, into what the past year has taught us, especially, you know, riding at home with COVID and all of that. So we just thought it'd be really interesting to revisit the topic and just put a new spin on it from uh, from our different takes of it from the past year. Cool. So we're going to start off this podcast with where does an idea come from? Yeah. Yeah. So guys, where does an idea come from? Where does an idea come from? <laughs> I think it's such a, a iffy topic to talk about. I mean, every writer in the history of writing has been asked this, like, how do you get your inspiration and where does it come from? And I never, like, I don't think there'll ever be a correct answer. I think it can hit you in any kind of way when you're watching a movie, listening to the radio, just driving on the road, an idea could hit you. And I think it's really interesting because once you get an idea, usually that idea then changes and morphs when you do research onto it. Like if it's something that really hits you and it's something you really want to follow, then that idea could change by the time it gets to the page because of all the research you've done. You're like, oh, this is actually an interesting way to tackle this topic or this conversation. But yeah, I don't think there's any particular way to say where an idea comes from. I think when it hits you, it hits you. Or like when it comes to like big feature or serious topics, it could just be topics you're interested in the public maybe seeing and maybe thinking about and maybe you're posting a question in the form of a movie. So I think it's really interesting to think of where it comes from, but I don't think you can really answer that question. I think I said this in uh, one of our Instagram stories, like go follow us if you not already. Hit that follow button. <laughs> <laughs> but I was thinking an idea sort of could come from anything, but it's sort of the idea doesn't really tell me what the short is going to be. It, it, for me, ideas are literally just like, oh, there's a bookcase and someone's moving in, like just in case, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, and then, and then after that, then we take, then we take like, okay, what happens in it to the five beat structure? How does it work? I don't think I've ever had like an idea for like a whole thing. It's mm -hmm. always been like an aspect or like a scene and then I build it out from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. And I think that also brings up like a, a you know, light to the fact that everyone's idea process is also different and like how 
you you guide it from when you got the idea to where you want to put it onto page to when you want to put it on screen. I think everyone's kind of different and their approaches to it and the way that they just tackle the writing process. You know? Yeah, I think an idea can come from everywhere. It might be like a character theme, it might be like a song, a mood, an atmosphere, anything. But I think what you guys are also talking about, which is really important, is like being able to ask that idea like the right questions mm -hmm. for it to like become something. Like you start like forming a lens through which to like process those ideas that come to you and like, yeah. oh, that could work for a story. Mm -hmm. And I felt mm -hmm. like as we've made more and more things, I felt like I've become better at processing things like into a story and subsequently sort of getting more ideas because you're sort of training yourself to that sort of lens to which to see yeah. how things might be yeah. connected in the story. Yeah. yeah, well, I think that's interesting what you're saying because like also when it comes to the writing process or like coming up with an idea, like in the beginning you can think it's like something really stupid or, or something like that. But I think what you need to remember is that not all stories have to be that serious because you could have brilliant ideas for skits and things like that. And sometimes light-hearted stories are also have their, like, their place within within the, the whole like story world. So yeah, I'd, I'd like... If you feel like you have a silly idea, keep writing it and see if other people didn't like it. I actually read like a post by James Gunn recently when they were asking him about writing writer's block and how does it come up with an idea. And then he says, just give yourself free range to write nonsense, basically. Like the only reason you have writer's block is because you're scared you're writing something bad. But if you give yourself the ability to write bad, like if you give yourself that freedom, then usually something nice, like something worthwhile is in there and you can just dig into it. So I think also just maybe the dedication put into it and sitting and writing, even if you're just starting to make things up, I think something can then hit you. If you do have a tight deadline or if you are trying to get that inspiration, you can sometimes force it by just allowing yourself to write bad sometimes. That's really interesting. Like I was also shocked to like read how serious he, because like his forms are so silly. And when you get to that level of be becoming a filmmaker, they get paid that much. There has to be some level of discipline too because you, you got to ask these questions where they're like, um, what's your advice for keeping up motivation and for keeping discipline? And he's like, if you have to ask the question of why am I writing, then you're probably not going to make it that far because you have to keep having that passion and that burning and that discipline to go with it to like just keep the writing. So the mo sometimes the motivation doesn't even matter, but the discipline's important because if you keep doing it, then it's just going to come out. I've also found that talking about writer's block specifically, I think the sort of right, being able to sort of not judge yourself and write sort of, any like nonsense is kind of like like free association writing to kind yeah. of like yeah. get yourself out of whatever like block you've put yourself in but then what i've also found with writer's block is that the reason why something isn't working where you are in the script is because you have, there's a problem earlier on like there, there's something you haven't set up probably properly or maybe an I'm event to maybe needs to come or sooner yeah. or something maybe something isn't sort of established in like a character yet or earlier on. And then once you go back and sort of start from the beginning and look at it that way, and then you get to that point again and it's like, oh, like, why was this even a problem? Like, of course, yeah. this, is where it's, yeah. this is where it's meant to be. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. I think also sometimes when you try and force an ending for a film, like you like if you're trying to say, oh, this is where I want the story to end, then that can also sometimes be problematic with how you write the story. Sometimes it can be a good thing because it can force you into creative solutions and things like that, but sometimes an ending just doesn't work. And if you're trying to force it, it could just make the rest of the story seem superficial. And mm. I know I think it's Tarantino that says sometimes he doesn't even know where his stories are going like until it, like till he's written the end. So I think yeah, that's also like a good way to just, if you're stuck with something, just see if you're not trying to just force the ending or anything yeah. like that those are all like really good different ways of, of, of getting around but i think you're just just watching yeah. that you don't force something is always a i think a interesting for me, thing for me is as well like uh, mark told me about this time that the the showrunner of doctor who a uh, stephen moffat was in like a what was it like a conference or something and somebody asked him what happens if you know this character does this thing or that person does that thing and him being this like showrunner who's written so many things it was just like guess i'll just have to make something up <laughs> and it's like oh yeah the writer literally has the ability to the make ability it. to make things and up change the situation exactly yeah. anything can change yeah, yeah because... you're like the master of 
right exactly the thing so if you like have a big problem you say okay i just insert this here and then just plant it the back go back in the story yeah way to plant it i think yeah mm-hmm. and i think that that specifically i was also talking about something that had been like set up in like the show's history or like canon or whatever mm. and then I, I think it also like a good point from that is just focus on like the story that you're telling now like no one's gonna just tell, just yeah. tell a good story now no <laughs> one's gonna care about all that stuff just make it up like you're the one making it up like you don't yeah. <clears throat> that's why it feels like on... cheating when, <laughs> when you no, say but that. i think i think that's actually like something interesting like if you look at that show chernobyl uh, they what they did in the show is there was a character they invented that was symbol symbolic of 12 other scientists and researchers because i think they just wanted to wanted you to be have a bit more of a human connection with those scientists and the only way to do that was maybe conglomerate them all into one person into one character so even though it's a story about something that real that happened i think creative liberties like that is so interesting to see when people do that for something that's historic and something that's proven history like something that's happened yet you still take your creative freedom with it just so it can connect and hit harder with the audience i think that's a really nice example of how you can change things because you're the writer even if it's something from like factual history just so it has a better commotion, uh, emotional impact and uh, just so the viewers can can connect better instead of just having 12 different characters that they then have to be introduced to. So I thought that was really interesting and that was just a, a nice point in our writer can actually change something just so it can work for the story. You know? I think yeah. I, but I think I disagree with that yeah. because what I, what I meant was in, in, in terms of like making something happen so having that creative freedom is like just in terms of like you being in charge of like your own story and being able to dictate the sort of themes and stuff. And I think we get stuck in like these like ruts that we've created for ourselves. But I think that's when we're talking about like a fictional narrative. I think when I found out that they had done that, Mm. and also when you look at other films that are based on true stories, like infamously like green books, just like a load of (laughs) nonsense, you get into a really like tough spot when you're dealing with with, with real life because it's these it's real people mm. and what I, I watched the series again after finding out about that just to look at her character because she like represented these 12 mm. people and it's like that character makes some like big decisions in the show and there's like some scenes where it's like just the three characters like standing in the room talking about these like huge events and stuff and like making these big decisions and this person's coming up with this idea because of that because Mm. that character said that when it's an actual fact if you're representing true people it's like no where did that idea actually come from because then you're giving far too much credit to that that manifestation of that that character when it's it's a real person they lived a real life Mm -hmm. who who actually came up with that it just Mm -hmm. feels like while I really like that show, there's still there's scenes where that feel like, oh, this is a series. Mm. This is where we're like writing a scene mm. and this is the things that actually happen. Mm. You know what I mean? But I think that's very interesting because I think that like opens a lot of topic for debate. Like, because I mean, if you look at the success of the show, was it attributed to that? Would it have been different if they did decide to make it more historically accurate? And, and uh, I think that is a very interesting point. And like with writing and most things, you can't really say what's the right or wrong answer. But it is interesting that you that you that you say that because yeah, I think maybe it was them just cheating, but. I don't no, know. I, I don't think know. I think I think it was maybe just a bit tough for them to make like a mini series with those characters. Yeah. But I think no, I think it is a, twelve people who don't do anything except for this one moment where yeah. they figure things out. Yeah, that's not. It out. No, it's like that's the truth. That's that's what happened. Yeah, it's but like, then I think then what's the difference then between storytelling? And just making them a real, like a, a reenactment, you know. Yeah, it's I mean? not a documentary. It's not. No, a no, I'm not saying. It's I'm not saying that you don't dramatize. I'm not saying that you don't dramatize things. I'm just saying that if you conflate things too much, or if you decide not to not to tell something like a side of something, like with Bohemian Rhapsody or something, hmm. that film is just is so garbage because there's just they're telling this really clean version of Freddie Mercury that people want to see. Hmm. When is that really the point? Yeah, but no, I, yeah. you, you want to tell the you want to tell the truth. I mean, I think I think you are very passionate about telling the truth, but I, and, I, and I agree. But I don't think that that means that you have to use the exact history for every single character. Like I, I think what they did was a good idea in Genopal because 
if there was like 12 other characters who literally were just standing around doing other things and then they pop up, oh, I've got this idea. I wouldn't have cared. Whereas this person who I followed, I care about her. And then they later on, they're like, but this person actually represents all these people. Then I'm like, oh, wow, this one person or like her stuff is real things. Mm -hmm. But it's not like... It doesn't take away the entertainment, which is what you want when you're watching a series and not a documentary. Yeah, but then you're, you're attributing the collective effort of all of those people into just one person when they all had, have like separate lives and there should be scenes where they're all working together to figure out this bigger, pro this bigger problem instead of just this one person who's like there for plot reasons. To further the plot. No, I mean, uh, I think I think it's interesting because I think with the show in general, I think there's going to be if people now find out about that, it gives quite a bit of division. But I think this is the, exactly what it is. I mean, for the writer, it's up to their discretion, and I think with either either story, like um, there's going to be separations of how people feel of how the story was told. But other than that, like I think in other areas of the story, like everything else was was done really well. But yeah, I think I think that's just exactly this debate that's happening now. Is the the, the issue with writing is that every person has their different take on it and, and what their version of what they want it to be would be different. So I think as long as you can make sure that you feel comfortable with the story that you've written for you as an audience member is acceptable and then uh, obviously with some responsibility to to make sure it's not too offensive to other people, I think then you'd leash on the right track. But I think that's a good story is when it opens up debates like this and and um, yeah, I think, I think real life adapting real life is just hard. Just yeah, because 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 I mean I mean you also like if you look at the success of it as well, I think that also attributes to. It. But I I think it just uh, yeah, requires. It was really successful, and that film is so problematic. Yeah, true. But I think that's more to do with like writing for the audience versus because I mean. Bohemian Rhapsody, like when you look at films like that, it's usually more aimed towards trying to make something that's like something that Brian Singer would want to make, like of his style. And then I think if you want to make something that's more true to the point, it's a bit hard for studios to kind of to, to fund those kind of things. I think, no, I think what's happening is that there's a lack of care by the studios mm. and the writers. Like, yeah, nobody, because nobody it's not the it. it's not the audience isn't going to know whether you're telling the truth or not. If you say this is based on a true story, then the audience is going to assume, OK, so everything that's happening. Yeah, See, that's really where the happened. problem lies, because there's so much power in being able to, like, shape the whole zeitgeist around that person. Yeah, or that like, character or that event. You can, like, you totally shape it. You say this is a true story. People, people believe every single event, scenario, character. I'm not saying that you shouldn't dramatize things and you're not making a documentary, obviously, and you can conflate things. And it's just like, I have a book of uh, the first man screenplay by Josh Singer. And the book is basically, it's the script. And then on the other side, it's transcripts and images and stuff of um, the research that he did that correlates with that part in the mm -hmm. script. That film, they conflate things. Some things happened there when that ha actually happened there. But the reason why he released the book is for complete transparency to be held accountable to so when anyone asks him about it, that the decision that he made to like a creative decision that he made to make a film and not the documentary it's right there like in paper because there is a huge responsibility in terms of representing the truth of like a character or an event but i think i think that also comes down to like so the writer, I think, has uh, brings their like, like writes the story and says, okay, this is like, if, especially if it's based on events, and says, this is where I want to take it. But I think, especially when you look at Bohemian Rhapsody and, and and a lot of other biopics that's similar in tone, where they kind of leave a lot of things out, I think that the, the biggest blame then falls on studios. You know, like the writer can only win so much in the battle, and I think when it comes to stories think, like that, and I also think, like when sometimes when the studio chooses the wrong writers for certain yeah. projects as well almost most adaptations when it comes to games and things like that, I think when, it, when you can see it's just a job someone had versus the passion they had from the beginning. Like, I mean, what was it? Sasha Baron Cohen wanted to do the original story for the BMW Rhapsody. And I think it just shows you when the studio is like, okay, this is a topic. Let's just throw a writer on it. Let's just throw a director on it. Then you can see when things are left out and, and, and it's just made for a more watered down audience. And I think that's when the problem lies for those things. I don't think the, the writing process for those were really the same as someone that was actually passionate about those events. But I think there's a way to do that then. If you if you know you're diverting, you're like going completely different or you're changing so much, 
then you don't have to stay based on a true story. You can say this is a fictionalized version of this person as a character, not not his history. Like, I'm not there by Todd Haynes. You know, he like took this idea of uh, Bob Dylan, but then he just made up these like different scenarios Mm -hmm. where they could play in. And then he like, that's sort of like, I think what you were getting at earlier, Caden, where you're like changing literally aspects so so like bob dylan was played by kate blanchett at a certain stage and it, he, he didn't say this is probably some stuff that happened to bob dylan he was like here's some interesting scenarios that bob dylan could have been in you know that's also and his, i think it's his interpretation and yeah well, and i think I'm that's very clear about being his interpretation yeah which is what i feel like a lot of screenwriters and directors when they do something like based on true fact there must also be like i wrote this I directed it. You know what I mean? So you think... Uh, like so Bohemian you... Rhapsody, for the normal viewer, they don't know all the ins and outs of how it's made and who directed it and who wrote it. They're seeing what they believe is the true story of it, even though it's not you know, presented as like a straight documentary. But then, I've, uh... still, I've, I've even watched films and then I've like looked at what actually happened and it's like, oh, that huge thing was but a then... complete fabrication. And it's like... How far do you take it? Yeah, I think then because I, I think what your main point is, not your main point, but what, what, uh, one of the things you're saying is accountability to the story. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, but I think at least with Chernobyl, at least at the end, they do acknowledge that, mm-hmm. listen, we did do this. So I think that at least was because yeah. we weren't completely duped at the end, you know, because yeah. you know, mm-hmm. then you, you want to research who those actual 12 people were. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I think that's, I think then that's maybe part of the solution for those kind of stories. It's just talking on accountability yeah. For those kind of things. I um, mean, that's why I think it's tricky, especially when you have an idea like, for me personally, I read uh, the book of Chris Barnard as well. And you, you read his life and you was like, he did some really, really bad things and some really intense things. But you, like, I was like, oh, if I had to write this, what creative freedoms could I have portray in this? Yeah. And I think when you, when you, maybe if you just put that into it, like if you're writing something that's from history, then just maybe make sure you put your the accountability out there. I think that's yeah. the main thing. Do you know why... Why people have to say that thing at the end when obviously when it's a true story, you say based on a true story, but you know why they always say this is a work of fiction, any sort of relation to true events is coincidental? It's because of no, it's because of Rasputin. Really? Yeah. Like back in the early days, there's a cool video on YouTube about this. The Rasputin family, I can't remember exact the exact details, but and then somebody made a movie about it, because they had read like a book. And then Rasputin sued them not for portraying him as a bad guy but for portraying his wife or his new wife or some mistress something so interesting and um and ever since then studios put that thing on there so that nobody can sue them anymore so that goes all the way back that's so interesting uh i just also just want to bring things back around so um i know it's been a year yeah well it was a beautiful like i love the debate because at the end of those kind of debates we, we find solutions like or uh, semi-solutions like we gave. But uh, I think for you guys, over the past year, what do you think it's been like writing something and then seeing actors played out and like seeing it come to screen? Because I know we've done, you guys have done um, the ones where we're at the table where you guys write something and the actors look at it and you get that experience. And then also you guys have written some stuff now recently with Sai Salmba, Pizza Pie and all that. What has it been like the whole scenario of like writing something then seeing it come to fruition and the challenges and our story has to change at the moment and well, what has that been like for you guys over the you know show? what we made screenwriting boot camp <laughs> and we did it accidentally because <laughs> uh we made all these short films we made 12 short films well not not last year but within 12 months we made 12 short films and you i'm not saying we are good i think we're pretty okay I don't think we know anything close to everything, but you sort of pick up uh, techniques and structures as, as you do it more often. And I think that's been a real a real help. It's been really interesting. I really enjoy seeing people do things and mm. like working, like seeing other people's talents. Like, wow, that's so cool. Especially when it comes from your head and seeing yeah, that, like, yeah, yeah. an idea you had is like, people's putting their actual labor and hard yeah. work into something. I'm amazing. always so stressed though, so I don't really pay attention to that on set. But then like when the edit's done or while I'm editing, I'm like, oh wow, this person's good. This person, oh, that camera movie, that was really nice. Ooh, the sound thing there. 
No, it's yeah, yeah it's yeah. it's cool. It's, it's interesting. It's I think for cool. me as well, like um, before, like I went to film school. My whole goal was just mainly be a director over a writer, and then obviously you had to write your stuff too, and then direct it eventually. And, and I think for me, because I'm such a visual thinker, the process of like when I write and stuff, I write very like dramatically. Um, so it's not like the most um, efficient way of writing, but like I can, I see it exactly in my head and I picture it in that like movie style. So when it comes to the directing part of it, I feel like it can be, maybe it's a bad thing. Like, I feel like I can be kind of like very stern on the kind of shots I want because I want it to kind of match as closely as possible in my head. So, but recently and over time, I've tried my utmost to like try and give uh, each department their freedom to also say what was your interpretation and can we try and also work that in. But I think at the end of the day, it is your responsibility as the writer, if you are the writer and the director to be the, the funnel, like all yeah. those ideas come through, but then you, you kind of see all the fault to see what, 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 what you keep out and what you want to keep in. Yeah. So I think it's, for me, it's pretty interesting, especially like recently we've done a project where I wrote and, and, uh, and we directed it and almost each shot was like how I saw it in my head, but it was just so interesting to see how people come yeah. together to do that. But then also to see what interesting shots come from other people's heads when they read your writing. Yeah. I think that's, that's a big part of it as well. Alex Garland, who... Uh, it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> wrote and directed like Dev's Annihilation, Ex Machina. Mm -hmm. He said that some some people refer to him as like an author and he like refuses that title. I know we've spoken about it in another podcast, but it relates back to being a collaborator because he says that he refuses to be like a uh, film by or something that's like yeah, just him yeah. because every single person like adds to that Definitely. idea. So I think maybe a good tip is like when you've also write, written it down, and you've got a very specific view of it. It's like, if you think about like, like Bong Joon-ho, for example, and when he made Parasite and then the book came out that he, and he storyboards oh, like no, was, yeah. every single no. shot and every <laughs> single yeah. movement or whatever. And every single shot in that film is exactly like it is in his storyboard. Yeah. But, mm. and you might think, oh, he's like being so exacting or whatever. But I can promise you, if you speak to anyone who works with him, he'll be like, he's the most collaborative I, dude. You know what I mean? I watched the, I, I listened to imagine. a podcast with him on that apparently that's the thing in korea not allowed to go out and shoot unless every single shot is storyboarded and mm -hmm. there's creativity within that as yeah. well every single person who's like filling that frame that you've drawn yeah. is going to yeah. add to it the, yeah. the actor the yeah. production design everything that's going and I on think, and it always just gives you such like things ideas you never would have thought of because yeah. i remember when i made my my student form uh like elders like there was this one scene where they're like bringing this uh, this lady in and they're like trying to hide her, bringing her into this house. And I just wrote like a normal Bucky. Whatever. And then the producer was like, I noticed like every five minutes in this area, there's always this ice cream truck. What if that's the thing that keeps like capturing people? Because you would never think of it. And I'm like, oh. yo, wow, what an idea. And then I even like fed into the title sequence and all that. So it's funny, like the ideas you're so blinded to because you're just so mm -hmm. into the story and like, mm -hmm. Literally, like, I can't remember who said it, but that quote that filmmaking is the collaborative arts, like, you know, like, it literally is one of the only mediums where everyone else is bring everyone else brings their art and their ideas into that one thing that you believe in. And that if, if communication is good enough and you're all kind of on the same page, it can bring something together that's something you would never have dreamed of in, in, in like, the good cases, like, when... Yeah, I've done... Them. Spoken about this before. I have have let go of films before on purpose to sort of, like, no, I'm not going to shot list. No, I'm not going to storyboard. I'm just going to... There's pizza pie. Gonna you chat about no shot list so, pizza pie. <laughs> pizza pie hasn't come out. People don't know about pizza pie yet. New form coming New soon. New form coming soon. <laughs> Plug. Um, that's the latest one that I did it with, but I started with Surface Tension. No shot list. I just chat with the, the DOP before, like, obviously talk about camera and lens choices mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. what kind of camera movements do we want mm -hmm. and then obviously i have the idea in my head i mm -hmm. i but I, I refuse to write it down not mm -hmm. for every film <laughs> definitely i have gone back and done it again for other films but i feel like some of the things when i don't do that come out much better mm -hmm. for example in surface tension uh, there's those shots like scene two or something the phone falling into the pool or whatever uh, and I just was like, let's shoot at a Frenchie. And I was like, what's a Frenchie? <laughs> I was just like, what's a Frenchie? I literally yeah. asked that same question on your Yeah, yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. And then he's like, no, it's when, you, when you're like behind them and you shoot like over the shoulder. And I was like, 
ooh, that's so cool. <laughs> and it's like you sound so proper when you say Yeah, <laughs> and like if, if I had storyboarded it or shotlisted, we wouldn't have gotten those shots. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm a big fan of letting people come up with ideas and then bringing them to me. And then I'm like, that's not really what I had in mind. Or yes, that's very good. Mm, that's cool. I, I, so I've, I'm not saying like I don't do any work, mm. Mm. but I have it in my mind. And this is not with every film, obviously. Mm. But I like that. I think it, it encourages other people to also come to you with ideas. I th- feel like if you always have an answer for everything, it's sort of like people don't want to mm. give ideas. They, they could be like, they could have a really good idea, but then like, nah, he, he, always, he knows what he's doing. I'm not yeah. going to even... So well, directing, you're not dictating. Yeah, exactly. Things. And like funneling, you're saying... People bring ideas and you're like, okay, no, this yeah, idea exactly. is, might be a good idea, but not for this, because yeah. you're directing them to that thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I think I think where that kind of attitude comes from, I think, is because you have quite a bit of experience also on filmmaking sets. I think when you're starting out, short filmmaking. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think when you're starting out, maybe on your first things, just to get rid of all the anxiety that comes with it, um, I think. And my lecturer used to say he preps as much as he can before a shoot and then on the day he just throws it all out. So I think it's it's kind of like what you're saying where you, you know what you want, but you don't kind of like, you don't kind of just force that idea. But I think that's the main, like, especially if you're trying to go for your first like short or something like that, I think do as much prep work as you can try and, but, uh, but on the day of set, if you want to do it like Yaku's approach, then don't like hold on to your story too much because the the, the collaboration really, mold the story to something beautiful but i think in like for me personally how i got rid of a lot of stress for like sets and stuff is i would like on the script itself i would draw out each like i think you guys saw like i'll draw out each frame and shot and then so i just have a guideline and like i'll have a shot list and i'll have that guidelines but when i get onto set i'm always like okay we're going to do this like this but what do you think would look better what do you think would feed into this because because then at least you have your shot to fall back on if no one does yeah. have ideas, you know? It's a good, yeah, that's good mm-hmm. because like sets can get very stressful when you're running out of time. Yeah. And then in that case, it is good to have a, a yeah. shot list that you can be like, okay, did we get this? Did we get this? Yeah. Yeah. Whereas if you don't have a shot list, then you just sort of like in your mind, like, okay, did yeah. we get everything that we needed? Yeah, it's, it's a nice thing to to know for safety having the back of your head and still then ask for those extra ideas. I think obviously when you have ADs on set, they're gonna, yeah, you know, they're gonna be really, really angry if you don't have a shot list or something that they can work off for timing. Yeah, as long as you know where you want to go and you have like some prep work done, then it's okay. But I think something that sort of ties that back to writing is the way I think about storyboards and shot lists. Is it's it's almost like a first draft of the actual yeah. script that you've got, yeah. and then from that you're able to redraft it <laughs> but you've got that first draft to exactly. build off from you're not mm-hmm. building off from like a blank page yeah. um like i've said this before even when you go into a short form that and you haven't got something written down you know exactly what you want so yeah, yeah. um and you're open to like a better or idea and that's mm-hmm. also a good thing when when with writing on the page and with like shooting something is if a grip has a better idea do that idea yeah. don't be like no i'm going to stick with my yeah. stupid idea are you the grip <laughs> because it's my stupid idea you just the grip what do you know i think if you create that environment obviously not where you know every single person's like directing like as a community because yeah. then but you're, you're, you're not, like you're you not the just funnel, the director yeah. but like i think you want to have that space where yeah. you want to leave it open to better ideas yeah. like also when you're writing a script and you ask for feedback and then let's say someone gives you amazing feedback and you're like, I'm not going to take it because that was yours. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. what? Everyone wants to want to make the best thing of that, like, the version of that thing. Then Exactly. No, I think because also like when I did this one short form, like I had the shot list and everything, but things just weren't working because of the location. So what I did was, and I feel like it just made the movie like a million times better, is I just said, like, when I, especially with the, the DOP, like, I was like just showing him the scene. I was like, okay, so this is what's happening. And the actors, we all did like the Mickey Mouse kind of run through of the thing. And then I just said, what do you think? Like, where, where, where do you want to take this? How would, and like, just, just play with it. And, and how that like short looked like in the end is like in the framing and, the, and, and everything and, like, it's just things I would never have, like, like thought about. Even, like, when it came to the room we were doing production, and you know, I was like, listen, this is the notes I've given you to the ca- of the character. And I just told the production designer, you, you you have my notes, you know what I'm on. Please just have your creative freedom with it and have fun with it, like, on, on these kind of guidelines. 
you know, like on this color. Or something. And then what they like do and how they designed the, the set was like something so like mind blowing, like it was so dry in my head compared to like what the production designer did. So I think definitely know where you want to go, but I think you're like, I think we keep just nailing on that point in that when you're taking your script onto, and especially if you're directing your own writing, don't hold on to it too tight because that holding on could actually kill the story. So just yeah. know. Facilitate, but mm. then also keep that like, clarity of vision yeah. still of like what this thing wants to be or like needs to be for it to be like told correctly yeah. but there's there's the creativity the around that yeah. and i think if you if you actually it's interesting looking back into like a lot of films like a lot of people's favorite scenes from those films would be something that the actor just improv on the day or something that just was spontaneous that you the things you could never ever think about and i think that's really interesting when we're talking about the process from going from from your idea to the page to go when you start shooting it, the the, the idea and the concepts and, and all of that's always changing and the process is always changing. And I think that's something that we've all learned a lot over these past couple of shorts and over those past couple of stories we've worked on, even on corporate things. So I think it's really interesting, like the main point is that things are always adapting and changing, usually for the better if you allow it. And and, and just be free to have uh, ideas coming from your crew because that's why they're there, you know? Mm. It's some really good points we spoke yeah, about I today. Yeah, we can wrap up yeah. there. That's a good one. So this this podcast went in all kinds of directions. It got pretty heated. <laughs> <laughs> so let us know, please, if you like this format, if you want us to continue with our department spotlight with our interviews, but then we can bring them into the set. Let us know what you guys think. I think it's pretty cool being in person. It's also cool. We've got three cameras. Three so cameras. it's... Uh, wait, wait, wait. Can I do it? This camera, this camera, this camera. <laughs> so if you aren't subscribed, do subscribe. If you haven't liked, then maybe like. Also, if you disliked it, then give it a dislike. Engagement is engagement. Also, subscribe. <laughs> I already said that, but also comment. If you want to have a question, leave it in the comment box yeah. below. Do the things. If you really dislike it, just keep smashing the like button. It usually like makes a super dislike. Yeah, so yeah. If you really hate it, you have to share it so your friends can see how much I ate it. Yeah. So that's the wisest thing to do. Yeah. 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 yeah and also, like, yeah, let us know what you think of this format because now you'll be also to see the rest of the department's uh, legs as well because a lot of people thought when watching this that the departments didn't have legs. So now you also get to see that in all this, in all its glory. So let us know if you like it. <laughs> Gotten a lot of emails. Where's everybody's legs? Where's legs? Where's what? the legs? <laughs> How does the production designer build things without the legs? <laughs> My life is a medium close. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a movie. So anyways, until next time, go out there, stay, stay safe, safe, and make your movie! movie.